isn't it a joy to meet new faces? Thank God for Facebook and for our connection globally on the internet. But this is so much better. And uh, we've just got to meet some of our folks that drove in from elsewhere, to Facebook friends with, and, uh, and Wendy and her husband. Johan is from Kimberley at South Africa, come on. But uh, we're living the most exciting days. I know we have um, a, a short schedule this morning, but I thank God that we participate in so much more than this morning's program. That the Spirit of God is the one who connects hearts, connects minds, allows our, our, our inner being to leap. Lydia mentioned yesterday, you know, how the babe in, in Elizabeth's womb leapt when she heard the greeting of Mary. And when we discover what we carry, you know, for Paul, this is such a focal understanding, such a pivotal thought that the mystery that was hidden for ages and generations is not Christ hiding somewhere in history or somewhere in our future expectations, or even somewhere in outer space. But it's Christ very present, Christ in you. In fact, there is nowhere in the universe where he would rather be and present in you. God is not putting up with you politely. You're his favorite dwelling. Yes. <laughs> you have no competition. <laughs> He says to Jeremiah in chapter 1 and verse 5, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. <laughs> That's a shocker. He knows you better than what you know yourself. And the father of the human race has no other agenda but to love you. I mean, Jesus shocks the Jewish world when he tells them no one knows the father. They thought they had God all wrapped up in the theologies and doctrines and the history and copyright on God and he says the son reveals him and he goes on in John chapter 14 he says if you've seen me you've seen the father that means any idea we could possibly have of God that is unlike Jesus could not be God not the one he introduces us to you see Jesus has come to not only reveal the image and the likeness of God to bring an end to all confusion about what our idolatry fed us with for centuries, our idol worship, our trying to create and manufacture images of God that we could possibly relate to. He comes and gives distinct image. Colossians 1.15 says he's the image of the invisible God. I mean, that means that God could never again go invisible on the human race. God had no other agenda but to express himself, his own being in human form. I'm so glad that Jesus' mission was not to start the Christian religion. He did not arrive on this planet to win a few desperate votes for the Christian cause. He had a much larger agenda. He came to exhibit the invisible creator of the universe, the architect of the universe, the engineer of your being. He came to exhibit him, not as in a display window, but as in a mirror. So with with unveiled faces, we may now, all of us, behold his image, his glory, resident. You see, what Jesus revealed, he also redeemed. Now, he did not come to planet Earth as an example for us. He did not come to compete with Buddha, Moses, and Mohammed. He came to exhibit who we are by the Father's design. Neither did he come to politely apologize on a faulty design. You know, maybe God entered into his rest just, just a little bit too soon. He should have just hung in there, you know. Wait. He came to celebrate the Sabbath of God. I so love the way he points to himself in Scripture. Remember in Luke 24, he's in conversation with the two folk, having just witnessed the, the drama of the cross and the very fresh, relevant rumor of the resurrection. And they just couldn't put it all together, and they left home that late that night to to Emmaus, and they were so confused, and they were debating the, the, the past happening, and suddenly Jesus himself draws near, and Luke is doing the interview. And Luke just cannot get to how it's possible for them not to recognize him. And then how he records 
their account by how he took them. Luke 24, 27, you can read this. How he took them through Moses, through the prophets, through the Psalms, and he pointed to himself. You see, he didn't give us scripture to confuse us. I wrote in the beginning of the Mirror Bible, which is an ongoing process. I wrote in the, right in the beginning, I call it the incarnation code. I said the Bible is perhaps the most, it is in fact the most dangerous book on planet earth. It has confused and divided more people than any other book. But it carries the gold. <laughs> it carries the gold. And in the prophetic voice, in the prophetic word, God continues to communicate, to awaken our understanding to that there is so much more to our being, to our beingness. We've been so trapped in the, in the realm of just knowing ourselves and one another according to the flesh. And here Paul comes and he says in 2 Corinthians 4, 7, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. We have what treasure? Christ. In earthen vessels, but for so long in blindfold mode, we were just so um, engaged with earthen vessel that we missed out on the treasure. We have friends in South Africa. They, um, there's a beautiful story connected to their, um, to their history. The, the, the old grandmother who's passed away some years ago now, she was engaged to marry one of the wealthiest farmers in South Africa. He was an ostrich farmer way back in the day. This was 65, 70 years back. And um, obviously, you know, that he had the wealth and it was on display, you know, on the size of the diamond on her finger and the gold-plated horse cart that they were moving around and all the, the top venues that they would visit, you know, they would socialize with the members of parliament at least. And, and this is just while they were engaged. And during her engagement, she had an encounter with Jesus and, and it became... Uh, rather embarrassing to her husband to be because the conversation just just couldn't change the subject was just Jesus you know so he broke the engagement and um, two years later she fell in love with one of the poorest farmers in South Africa he was living in the free state in uh, Udendal's rest area and um, he had nothing he owned nothing he just worked at the mercy of the farmer lived in a very small little shack and she fell in love and you can imagine you know from that high life to just Marrying this poor man, working on somebody else's farm. Seven years later, though, they bought that farm. And shortly after they took title deed, the first gold in the free state was discovered on their farm. And she wrote a document. This is now 60, 65, 70 years ago. She wrote a document just bearing testimony to this and how the gold that's been there all along, you know, we've, I mean, those farms are all maize farms. Do you know what maize farms are? And that was it. That, it was a maize farm. So would you buy a farm in that area, you buy the maize production. But all along the gold was there. But grandfather's plow just missed the gold. And for so long we've diligently labored to engage with a harvest that can never satisfy. You see, we are not designed to live by bread alone. Because bread represents what we can labor for, what we can show for our work, for our skill, for our giftings. And in John chapter 4, Jesus says, while they're walking through the fields, he says, um, do you not say there are yet four months? Then comes the harvest. And then he whispers, because you've got to read it in between the lines. He says, you're looking at the wrong harvest. Because the one you labor for will not satisfy you. But if you care to lift up your eyes, I want to show you a harvest that is already ripe. Now, now at what point is a harvest ripe? Only when the seed in the ear or in the fruit matches the seed that was sown. And so we've bought into this whole idea of we're just going to have to hang in there and wait for it. I'm so glad that, you know, Whatever it was that religion sold us, especially the two lies of distance and delay, were all cancelled in Jesus Christ. <laughs> Whatever it was that we justified, well, we're not there yet. <laughs> he says, lift up your eyes. I want to show you something that happened that you cannot add to. It's right. You see, when Isaiah speaks about this in Isaiah chapter 40, he says that 
a voice cries in the wilderness, and the voice says, every high place shall be brought low. Every valley shall be filled up. Every crooked place shall be made straight. That means even the question marks will become exclamation marks. <laughs> I'm so glad the Holy Spirit said to Paul, remember when he was struck blind to his old theologies and his old doctrines, the Holy Spirit said, go to the road called straight. <laughs> You're speaking about a revelation, an unveiling. The gospel is not meant to confuse us. Sadly, the Christian community has become the most divided community on this planet. Why? Because we're all trying to invent our own faith. When Paul says there is only one faith that matters, it's not what we believe about God that defines him. <laughs> Ephesians 4 says there is only one Father, and there is only one faith. So what the Father believes defines us. <laughs> and you know what? Jesus is what God believes about you. He didn't come as an example for you, but of you. He didn't come to entertain you with, with new possibilities. I mean, the ugly duckling. Do you get the ugly duckling story in America? He wasn't confronted with a potential swan. You know, if, if you really go through all these facelifts and how to fake the swan life courses, then maybe eventually you can qualify to kind of be upgraded to swan life. Jesus says, if you continue in my word, the original, not even the red letter edition, the word that was before time was, the idea of God, the logos, the logic of God. If you continue and you follow the prophetic pattern and its completeness in time, When the fullness of time arrived and his presence was made known and he came to redeem the treasure, he came to unveil his nearness. Jesus did not come to reveal the otherness of God, but his likeness. So Isaiah says, every high place shall be brought low. Every possible. This is now in the wilderness. Imagine mankind trapped in the wilderness of a distant God. And God says, I will cancel every definition of distance through one act of righteousness. I will step into your world and cancel everything that could possibly justify separation. You see, we, been, we didn't begin anywhere else but in the genesis of the most intimate thought. We began when Elohim declared, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. And what God revealed of his image and his likeness satisfied him. And he did not enter into his Sabbath rest because he felt exhausted. You know, even God needed a bit of a break. No, his Sabbath would become the eternal celebration of perfection. Everything that he is was on exhibit in human form. So Jesus did not come to apologize for a, for, a, for a faulty design. He came to vindicate your form. We have so underestimated what it is that we carry. We've plowed the fields diligently, producing our own bread, and missed the gold. 2 Corinthians 4, just before Paul says that we have this treasure in earthen vessels. He says in verse 4 that the God of this world blindfolds the minds of the who? Of the unbeliever. And I'm not even quoting the mirror Bible here. You'll love it in the mirror. I mean, this, this, this will not be, we won't be able to do it in a half an hour this morning if we get mirror. <laughs> but I mean, you can read in any translation of your choice. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4, the God of this world blindfolds the minds of the Unbeliever. Do you know that it means that the God system of this world, the religious system of this, this world, cannot blindfold your mind without your permission? He needs your handkerchief so that you can blindfold you. To keep you from seeing what? The light of the gospel. What does the light of the gospel reveal? The glory of God in the face of a man. The glory of God, but it was hidden all along. The geologists didn't go and sneak into the farmer's land and you just want to be nice to the farmer. You know, sometimes we think that grace is a little bit like this, you know, that, that God just comes and he blesses us with a few gifts, you know, like Easter eggs, you know, it's all wrapped up neatly. And, and so he'll hide it. And then he goes the next day and he, he's like, knocks on the door. He says, I've got this report for you. There's gold on your farm. 
He says, no, there's not. I mean, oh no, my grandfather's grandfather plowed these fields and all they produced was just grain and bread and whatever it was. And he says, no, I can go and show you. And they show you something, little, little, little deposit of gold. But then if you do this and that and the next thing, oh, you can get more. You see, religion needs paying and returning customers. So religion thrives on those two lies, the illusion of distance and the illusion of delay. When Jesus declares in that triumphant statement in John 14 and verse 20, he says, in that day you will know that I am in my Father. Your knowledge does not put him there. But you'll know it. And what else will you know? That on the same basis that I'm in my Father, you are in me. And I'm in you. He has come to declare no distance. No separation. So the God of this world blindfolds the minds of the who? The unbeliever. Who is the unbeliever? It's everyone who does not agree with God about their true design. Do you know what killed a generation of free people in a wilderness? I mean, Israel was legitimately free from Pharaoh. They could at no point blame Pharaoh for their wanderings in the desert. They went on a 40-year detour, not touching the promised land, but blessed by 24-7 miraculous events. Do you know that they died because of unbelief? Says Hebrews chapter 4. They died because of, not believe, because of a lack of oxygen or a lack of provision or a lack of the miraculous. Do you know that the supernatural is not proof of faith? I mean, they had supernatural signs and wonders, 24 7, laid on. But they died in unbelief. What was the unbelief all about then? Numbers 13 33 says, 10 out of the 12, normally the majority vote, it often works like that, you know, where 10 out of the 12. Leaders, these spies were not volunteers, some bright, they were representing the nation of Israel. Each one had a specific tribe and he represented his tribe. And they went to see, with a question mark mode, whether God's promises are true or not. Often when you approach scripture with a question mark, you'll come out with a bigger giant question mark than you've ever imagined. But two of them went to the different spirit. They went to the, yeah! <laughs> exclamation mark mode we're well able to take these giants no problem, no problem. <laughs> but ten warned the nation and said impossible wonderful potential is hidden in that land but there are giants there and the moment the idea of giant is sold the giant begins to grow in proportion They died in the wilderness because of what? Unbelief. unbelief. What was their unbelief all about? Same number, 1333. The leaders explain why they feel it's better advice to just hang around in the wilderness. He says, those giants were of such enormous proportion that we looked to ourselves like grasshoppers. And the way you see yourself is the way you project yourself. It says, and so we appear to them. And the nation went, oh, they were shaking with fear. They said, let's rather stay in the land than in this, not the promised land, in this wilderness land, because at least we've got the cloud, we've got the presence, we've got the daily provision. I mean, manna gets a bit boring, but we've got the quails, so we've got so much to be really thankful for, and let's move everything in our theology over to the next world, and some golden daybreak, Jesus will come and do it, and then we'll enter Canaan. If all God wanted was you in heaven, why did he ever put you on planet earth? When God swears by himself and he says, as truly as I live, all the earth shall be flooded with a what? With the knowledge of my glory. It's already flooded with glory, but we just don't see it because we read newspapers. So we just see, oh, what Obama said now and what this guy did there and this. And so our minds get so cluttered that we miss the glory. Plowing our fields, doing our labor, eating our bread, hungering again for tomorrow's harvest. Lift up your eyes. There's another harvest. Doesn't need your toil. Doesn't need your toil. 
It's a done deal. The gold doesn't lie. Then think, oh, I hope it's going to rain tomorrow so I can become better gold. No, no, no. The rain's not going to do it for the gold. But this discovering gold certainly does it. So here was Israel trapped in the wilderness of unbelief because they believed a lie about themselves. The leaders convinced them that you're grasshoppers. And it's amazing how in our theology and our Western theology how we've inherited the idea that we are miserable, ugly ducklings. God made a mistake when he made us. No, Jesus came to redeem his father's integrity of your authentic design. Of your authentic design. You're an image bearer of Christ. You see, in all three parables in Luke 15, when Jesus speaks about the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son, what does the word lost say to you? You cannot be lost unless you belong to begin with. So if Psalm 24 1 says, the earth is the Lord's, not by popular vote, by God's belief. How much of the earth shall we then add to, oh, well, we, we go into our like, uh, Google modes and we say, how many Christians are there? You know? And we just, uh, for, just, just for the sake of statistics, we'll all group together. You know? We'll get even the, the churches across the road and the Catholics. We've got to get as many in as well because we've got to do it. We've got to try and weigh out the scale against them, the, the Muslims. So we've got to try and just establish a Christian presence on planet earth. And God says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and those who dwell in it. Do you know that a thief never becomes an owner? Not in God's logic, but in our theology, we give the devil ownership. We preach a defeated devil back into business and trap generations of sincere people in the same old wilderness mode. The goosebumps are there, the blessings are there, but we're not possessing the nations. We're not possessing the earth. <laughs> Blindfold mode can keep you going. But you must out on feasting on the harvest that's already ripe by his doing. So what was Israel's unfall about? Just one thing. They believed a lie about themselves. You know that you're his masterpiece. He fashioned you in your mother's womb. He says, you're fearfully and wonderfully made. He says, the scripture has a history much larger than the book. Thank God for the book. I love the Bible. I study it daily as much as I can. Lydia and I, we've just celebrated well, our 35th wedding anniversary. and we've, We know each other since she was 16. I was 19. That was 40 years ago. And I thank God for the documents. I'm sure it's somewhere there. We're a legitimate couple. But I mean, we're not, we're not into our documents. We're into one another. <laughs> Sometimes we can get so loaded like the scribes and the Pharisees with information. We've got to download this one. Have you heard this? And we're busy with all the documents trying to get our ducks in a row. And we miss out on the romance. <laughs> you see, rules do not add to romance. It takes the sharp edge off it. And God's off the romance. Because you come from there. You began in him. And he's come to redeem that space that belongs to him anyway. I once was lost, but now I'm found. You see, we've underestimated the incarnation, what it was that, that the word proclaimed and the destiny of the word to be fulfilled in incarnation language. Incarne, in flesh, in sarx in the Greek. Flesh. <laughs> so glad Jesus didn't arrive in Spider-Man suit, you know. But his mother's womb bore witness that his birth was the expression of a human vessel in whom the fullness of the Godhead bodily dwells. We've come for a brief visit to Florida. We left most of our belongings, thank God, at home. <laughs> We've got two bags and third one with all our stuff in it, you know. Oh, Jesus, I'm so glad he didn't come for a brief visit. You are his address. You are his abode. 
And it's come to redeem our minds from the lies that we believed about ourselves. If you fast forward Israel's history from Joshua 13, verse 33, to Joshua 2, 11, this old generation died now. So there's a new generation, and Joshua and Caleb, the two who saw the same giants, but with a different spirit. Do you know that your view, your idea, becomes your eyes? And then they took the new generation into the promised land. And in Joshua 2.11, we, we read the account of how the two spies, I'm so, so, so glad that Joshua left the other ten at home this time. He just trusted two, so he sent two spies in. And these two went, obviously, in camouflage. Then go around and say, we are Jews, we've come to take your city. No, they went in camouflage, and they, they thought it was good to connect with, with one of the ladies of reputation who lived in the wall. And by the, time, by the time she discovered that her two new clients are from Israel, she was shocked. She kind of said, what took you so long? Come on, we heard 40 years ago how your God delivered you from Pharaoh, from slavery. What took you so long? She says, and you know what? There was not a man in our midst that wasn't shaking with fear. When Paul sees the cross in Colossians 2, 14, 15, he gives us a glimpse of what happened there, publicly, where God disarmed principalities and powers. Didn't put them on hold, he disarmed them. Would you believe that the cross was a success? Yes. <laughs> if the cross was a success in terms of the redeeming the image and the likeness of God. Remember the theme of this book is the image and likeness of God. Idolatry is the antichrist. It's the opposite of trying to manufacture my own ideas and theologies and doctrines and, and, and scholarships and stuff what I, that I'm trying to figure out God. You don't have to figure him out. He's figured out you. And he's head over heels in love with you. He has no one in the universe that could replace you. You are absolutely irreplaceable. No one carries your DNA. And God wrote the script of your DNA when he fashioned you in your mother's womb so that he may find within you an expression of himself that gives you your eternal uniqueness and value. We have this treasure in earth and vessels. But the God of this world blindfolds the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel, which is the glory of God unveiled in you. And the glory of God carries the ingredient of every attribute of God. Do you know that that makes our fellowship absolutely amazing? Because now fellowship is not something that we have to drag our feet to go and do. Oh, it's fellowship time. You're going to sit there. What are we going to talk about tonight? <laughs> I mean, uh, we have three boys and one daughter. And uh, our daughter is pregnant, very pregnant, <laughs> with our first grandchild. We arrived, and we kind of, we're landing in Cape Town on the 18th of February, and we kind of think that Nicola could land more or less the same time. We're praying that she'll just hang in there a little while, so we can just kind of, but we most probably will land on the planet the same time. Um, but when we were arriving, we came back from America last year on the 3rd of July, and she was waiting at our home with a little photograph of what she carried, size of a peppercorn. We were blown away. We just stood and wept. So glad to celebrate your birthday, my brother. We've taken so much for granted. But here we are. Here we are. In human form. You cannot be more present anywhere on this planet than what you are right now. When Jesus took these two men to that point, and Luke interviews them, and they arrive at their address. And I always wondered why Luke wrote that kind of detail. It appeared that he was going further. Have you noticed that? Luke 24? They have this engaging conversation. They reflect on it, did not our hearts ignite within us while he was opening to us the scriptures. We thought we knew the Bible, and suddenly these old familiar scriptures became life to us because we saw ourselves mirrored there, and our hearts began to resonate and ignite. 
And then Luke writes, it appeared that he was going further. And they could have said their polite goodbyes, or we could at least have asked Luke, just add something in about like an altar call so that we at least can bring closure to our conversation. Because Jesus got these two guys, they're red hot, you know, sign on the dead dotted line, where do I join this club? And while every head was bowed, no, no, it appeared that he was going further. He knew that the job was done. <laughs> you can trust the design of the human heart. You can trust the agape of God to do what only it can do. Igniting hearts. And then they constrained him. They said, sir, stay over, wouldn't you? It's quite late. The hour is late. Stay over. Let's have a bite to eat. So we kind of think, you know, in our theology, they went in and they had communion. No, no, no. They just went for, for, for a meal. They were hungry. They walked for long. They talked a lot. And then he grabbed the bread and he broke it. And suddenly the eyes were opened. What did they see? Every meal, our next meal for that matter, celebrates the incarnation. What every historic reference we have of him is now eclipsed by a new unveiling of eating the true bread of heaven and realizing that my whole being is consumed. I'm not designed to live by bread alone, but by the original thought of God, the original language, the communication of God's expression of himself mirrored in me. And they ran back to Jerusalem. <laughs> Nothing mobilizes our lives more that discovering the unveiling of Christ in us. You see, Jesus doesn't warn us to see him in too many people. He rather warns us not to miss him in the most unlikely. The God of this world blindfolds the minds of the unbeliever to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel. So it's a gospel unveiled. I'm so glad. Remember, remember, we're reading 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4. Paul didn't write in chapters and verses. Thank God for chapters and verses. Makes it easy to find. But just before that, he said, And now, with unveiled faces, we are beholding the glory of the Lord as in a mirror. Woo. Not as in a display window. Because that's back to the law language again. You've got to do to get. As in a mirror. And what happens? Metamorphosis happens. Something happens within me that ignites a new understanding. That's why Paul in his prayers in Philippians and Ephesians, every he says, I pray that the eyes of your understanding will be flooded with light. The only difference between the hidden gold and the gold that's lying in vaults in Swiss banks is that the Swiss bank gold becomes currency. That's why we proclaim the gospel. The adventure of declaring to people that there's so much more to you than what meets the eyes. And we have a reference. The fullness of the Godhead bodily dwells in Jesus Christ. Colossians 2 verse 9. And that would have been an amazing statement. But verse 10 says, and you are complete in him. So when we discover our true location. I mean, Lydia and I got here by GPS yesterday. Thank God for the lady that was doing this talking. <laughs> and, uh, and we got here. We've never been here before. And we could trust the connection and travel a new road as if we've been there before. And that's exactly what is communicated in this gospel. Holy Spirit has come to reconnect our understanding to our original genesis to our original value. He's come to declare himself in you. Brother, this is it now. This is 10 to 11. Wonderful. Wonderful.